Well, happy spring. Yeah. It is definitely spring outside, and that is exactly um, that last song and that last statement. It's unbelievable. We're going to uh, start this morning reading uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. But before, before we do that, I want to I ask a couple of questions just to get just to set the mood and, and, and get, get, your mind, get your mind going. On your way into church this morning, did you see what I saw? Did you see a lot of people doing lawn work? A lot of people outside? It's a good thing to be able to be outside, but I, I was wondering as I came in, I wonder if there's as many people out doing lawn work as there are will be in church. Because it seems like those seem to be the same priorities, and they shouldn't be. And it makes me sad. It does. It makes me sad to know that it's not a priority for a lot of people. It's just not. So, um, questions I want to ask is, first, do we care? Do we care about that? Do we care that there are people out there that don't put church as a priority? By not putting church as a priority, they're not putting Jesus as a priority. If they're not putting Jesus as a priority, then they're, they're exactly that. Whether they profess to be Christians or not, if they don't have him as Lord of their life, then they don't have his salvation. Um, and there are a lot of people that may think they do, but they don't. And we're not necessarily Gnostics where we have a hidden knowledge that we need to bring to them. But what we do need to do is, is show them that it is a priority. Show them that it is, um, it is important. So what are we doing about it? Um, do we have a church goal? Do we have a goal set for the church? And I sit down with a piece of paper um, and tried to try to make like, what do I, if I had a goal, I'm not, I'm not visionary by any means, and I'm not trying to project any personal thing on the church at all. But what, what would my goal be for Tillman? What would my goal be for the church? You know what I came up with? I got nothing. I got nothing. And that makes me sad too, but, but, but I realized in writing that I may have a personal goal, but I need to ask the church what, what the church's goal is because I'm, I'm just part of the church. You know what I mean? So what is the church's goal? That's something that I'd like you to think about this morning, this evening, this week. What is your goal for the church? Like you may have one or two or three. It doesn't matter. Do you want to see it to grow in number? I do. Do you want to see it grow spiritually? I do. Do you want to see our children grow in knowledge and wisdom and faith in Jesus Christ? I absolutely do. I think these are legitimate goals and reasonable. And we don't have to set a number and say, I'd like to see us grow by 10 people or four families by 2022. We don't have to do that. But we should have a goal we're shooting for. If we don't have a goal that we're reaching for, that kind of says that or implies that we are where we think we should be. Or we're at least happy. So, so do you have a goal individually in your personal ministry? Remember that everybody's a minister. And, and we all minister to people in our lives. How does that goal relate collectively to the church? And if you don't have a goal then, does that mean or do you feel, and, and I want you to reflect on this, are we satisfied with where we are as, as a church? And I say all that to say this, and I'm not trying to get on a soapbox, and I don't want any pats on the back or none of that. I will take a hug. Um, but if you witness to people, and if you have been witnessing to people, and you've been sharing the gospel, are you burnt out? Are you tired? I tell you, revival was awesome. We had a great revival. Brother Alfonso did great. Easter sunrise service was awesome. I really enjoyed it. I felt like, I'll be completely honest, I felt great about it. I did. Um, but what should be reviving and give more energy exhausted me. I'm tired. I am burnt out. I am tired. Uh, not of sharing the gospel or the truth, but because of everything that that means. And so what I realized this week in thinking about how tired I was and how to get back on track is that the Holy Spirit knows the heart of every soul. That includes the lost. He knows them. God will help us witness. We don't do it by our own skills, ability, energy, or power by any means. And, and if, you're, if you attend church tonight or invite somebody to come with you to church tonight, we're going to kind of talk about that. Um, precursor will be in Acts 17, where the Holy Spirit empowers Paul. 
um, in the, in the to, to spread the word throughout the church at Thessalonica and Berea. But the Holy Spirit empowers us. So we don't have to worry about witnessing this burden of, you know, I've been sharing the gospel and I've been witnessing to these people and they're just not reacting or, or receiving it the way that I'd want them to. I, I'm tired of telling them the same thing over and over again. Why aren't they reacting to it? It's because it's not on our time. And it's not because of our ability. It doesn't matter how we say what we say. The minute that they receive the truth, it's the Holy Spirit acting on them. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. So what we do, we don't, have, we don't worry and be burdened about witnessing. Amen. What we do is we practice the art of witnessing. We pray about it. We study so that we can have those words to speak. And so when the Holy Spirit gives us the words to speak, we're confident when we say it. Amen. But most of all, we trust. We trust that God is in it. We trust that God is with us. And we trust that God is with them. That we, let, we plant the seeds and let the Holy Spirit water it. And let God call them the way that only he can. They're not going to come to faith because of anything that I say. They're going to come to faith because what I say is the word of God. And God's word works on them. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I read, I read this, this scripture. I, it came up on one of my, I'm, I'm, I don't know how many daily devotionals I'm signed up to. I bet I get them in my email and on my phone all the time. And this was one of them that came up and I'm like, I needed that one. It's Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is life, which is exactly what Brother P shared this morning, and we didn't talk about that at all. There is no, I do not subscribe to coincidence. I believe that God is at work in everything that he does, um, and I believe that's something that we all needed to hear this morning, not just myself. Uh, so that, that's the beginning of the sermon. If you would, go with me to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us to be here together to worship you in your name. We gather in your name. We pray that as you have promised, you will be in our midst. We pray that you lift us up today. You encourage us and you empower us. You revive us and give us strength. That we leave feeling a sense of urgency for the sharing of your gospel, but also encouraged because of our witness. It would be easy, and it is easy, to be discouraged, downtrodden, burdened, because of the, the, the lack of priority in people's lives around us. For your truth but we know as long as we live it and as long as we have breath to speak it that your work will be done that it will not fail that you will complete the work that you began in all of us we pray that you help us be a conduit for your truth and your grace and we pray that by our lives someone someone is touched the seeds are planted even if we don't get to see them watered we pray that you're here with us today and we pray that you give me the words to speak and all of us, all of us, hearts to receive. It's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen. So um, if I were to ask you in the past year, in the past year, what do you think the most, it might be a, might be a toss up now that I think about it, but uh, earlier I had the answer. Uh, toss up between, what do you think the last year was the most talked about subject? Fires. Fires. That was the answer that I had. I almost just thought about maybe the election. Maybe that would have been it. But, but the virus, right? It was definitely the most talked about subject in 2020, 2021. You know why? It was scary. It's been scary. It's very contagious. Everybody, that was the first thing they said. This time last year, we weren't in church. This time last year, we were doing drive-in services and online only. So it's a blessing to be back here today. Now, I've got a six-year-old. I've got a six-year-old young man that is... Um, it gives me this look every single time we come to church now about the offering. He wants to do this. He wants to take that offering. He keeps telling me, is Clay going to do it with me? Because he wants to do it, but he doesn't want to do it alone. So I can't wait for the day that when we get to get back to doing that because it was amazing to watch Will and Landon. It was amazing to watch them. I didn't grow up doing that. But to have kids that want to do that, that means the world to me. It means the absolute world, and I want to do things like that. But the virus is contagious. It, it, they, they said that from the very beginning. You know what? What else is contagious? It's fear. Fear might be more contagious than the virus itself. And that is exactly what the world spread 
last year up until now was fear. One way or another, everyone was afraid. We were either afraid of the effects of the virus, we were afraid of getting the virus, we were afraid of what the virus and what the government was doing was going to do to our church, how it was going to affect our lives. We were all afraid. Every, everyone was afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of certain things. Let me give you some statistics that I learned. I learned this. I kind of already knew them, but I, but I, I learned more about it this week. I got the opportunity to go uh, to Oakland City uh, this week and, and speak with an apologist. Uh, of course, y'all, everybody knows I've said I'm, I'm really into apologetics. Very novice at it. But I love, I love how you can talk about and prove Scripture logically and with reason. I, I truly believe that our children are missing why we believe. This is what we believe, and this is why. And it needs to come from more than just because the Bible says so, which I do not want to discount the Bible because it is 100% authoritative, 100%. But we have to tell them why we believe it's authoritative before they believe it. You know. So anyway, I like apologetics. They sent out this message to all the pastors um, in the southern Indiana, northern and western Kentucky area to come, and, and I thought it was going to be this, this big thing, so, so I went. Uh, Brother Keith and I, we rode together. Uh, carpool, and it was going to be a big time. You know how many pastors showed up? Two. You know who it was? We rode together. We rode together. Now, I'm discounting uh, Brother Dennis Powell. He was also there, but he was the one hosting it, so I'm not counting him, because he was going to be there. Two. And that, that took me aback. But then, after we talked, and we got to discourse with this super smart guy, um, you know, which is kind of like, ooh, you know, put me, put me way down, you know. But, but he was very humble about it. Um, the chaplain at Oakland City was the one that invited him to come because he wrote a book and uh, he travels around. He's a, he's a traveling evangelist, apologist, you know, whatever. And he, they shared some statistics. And here, here's the stuff that bothers me. Oakland City is a Christian university. Everybody knows that, right? But they're not exclusive to Christians. They allow anybody to come in because what they've said is throughout the years, there's been a lot of evangelism happening in Oakland City. And in the past, they've predominantly been, uh, the students have predominantly been more Christian than not. That is not the case anymore. They are more non-secular, uh, is what they say. That the students, when they are asked in a survey to identify, more identify as non-Christian than they do Christian. Another one, something that he's worried about, the chaplain, um, is that in the past, they've had as many as 10 student-run Christian organizations, you know, the students, the freshmen, juniors, whatever they do, they get together and they study the Bible together or they do outreach stuff together, but they, 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 they have a student-run club, right? As many as 10, as few as one or two. They have zero. They have zero student-run Christian things. You know, one of the biggest problems they're dealing with um, in... Uh, at, Open city right now, gender and homosexuality at the school, and they they want to they want to fix that. You know what the statistic is for a Christian student that goes to college to stay in the faith? Seventy five percent of students who go to college leave non Christian. Seventy five percent. Now, to give that some perspective and why it bothers me and why it scares me is I have four children. That statistic means that only one of them will remain with the faith. Only one. That's what we're in combat with. That's what we're, that's what we're battling as a church. So when I ask, you know, should we set some goals? I really think we should. I really think we should. But after, after the resurrection... After our Easter service, I still am encouraged to know that there are people out there that do believe what we believe. It's, it's, the, the difference comes with, with how fervently they believe it, how much passion they have for it, and what it means for their life. To believe that you're saved is, is not the same as acting like you're saved or living. I won't say acting like. I'll say living like you're saved. To have Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life is different than just having him as your Savior. I have an insurance card just in case I get in a wreck. That doesn't mean I'm protected from being in a wreck. You know what I'm saying? Jesus is not an insurance card. He's not that. So do, do you know that you, you are contagious? 
Every one of us is contagious. We're carrying something. We're always carrying something, especially us as believers in Jesus Christ. But is what you're carrying worth catching? We talked, um, we talked on Wednesday night, uh, Psalm 35. We studied Psalm 35, and one of the things that I, that I gleaned from that scripture was uh, um, that we should carry around, a, we should walk around with a posture of faith rather than an attitude of angst. That we should, we should have a faith that people recognize. And so if you're, if you're walking and talking as if though the world is going to hell in a handbasket and there's nothing to be thankful for and our leaders are junk and uh, the virus is going to kill everybody, and oh, but, but I do believe in Jesus. What is it that people are going to get from you? What are they catching from your attitude and your, your words and the way you live? Right, they're catching that angst, or they're catching that depression, or that downtroddenness, or that discouragement. And, and for me, I mean, big time for me, I don't need to be walking around discouraged because I don't, aren't you, don't you preach, you know? I, I do, but I'm very discouraged about it. <laughs> I definitely don't need that, you know? So we need to stay encouraged. This is what, this is what Paul writes to the, uh, the believers in Thessalonica. I'm going to read uh, the first chapter of uh, 1 Thessalonians. If you would go there with me. And then we'll go through the verses a little bit. I'm going to read, and I'm, I'm doing something different this morning. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It may be different than the King James, um, but, but I, wanted, I wanted the clear language because I'm going to pick some of these words out that are not in the King James. He says in verse 1, This letter is from Paul, Silas and Timothy. Now, just, just real quick note, um, Paul and Silas traveled together a lot. He mentioned Timothy because history tells us that Timothy was the one that delivered this letter to the Thessalonians. So he would have actually showed up in Thessalonica at the church and he would have read it to them and then given them a copy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica to you who belong to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. May God give you grace and peace. We always thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly as we pray to our God and Father about you. We think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope that you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece <coughs> throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia, where, for wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. We're carrying something. Every one of us is contagious. Think of our faithful work, our loving deeds, and our enduring hope. Why did they have faith, love, and hope? Paul says it was because of Jesus Christ. In verse 5 he says, for when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. So they brought the good news, and the Holy Spirit opened up their hearts to it. And they received it. And not just, not just received it and, and did something with it, but they received it and they took it in and it changed their lives. What is the good news? The good news is that, that Jesus didn't come for the healthy, He came for the sick. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinners. So if, if we had, 
And I hope we are. If we had someone walk into this church drunk, walk into this church homeless, walk into this church hand in hand with somebody of the same sex, while we won't condone the sin that they're in, we will open these doors because it's a hospital for the sin sick. And they can receive God's power here around us because we're contagious, because we have faith, hope, and love. And we live that way. Francis Schaeffer uh, is a famous apologist from long ago, 19, I say long ago, 1920s, 1930s. And he was asked this question. It's a very famous, very famous quote. He was asked, what would you do if you met a really modern man on a train? Now, that should tell you how old it is, right? Modern man on a train. Um, and you just had one hour to talk to him about the gospel. And Francis Schaeffer replied, he said, I've answered this question over and over again. And it's the same every time. I would spend about 45 to 50 minutes talking about the negative, talking about the bad things in this world to really, really show him his dilemma, that he is morally dead. Then I would take 10 to 15 minutes to preach the gospel because I believe that much of our evangelistic and personal work today is not clear simply because we are too anxious to get to the answer without having a man realize the real cause of his sickness, which is true moral guilt. Not just psychological guilt feelings, but a moral guilt in the presence of God. And that, that should shake us. That we do, we preach the gospel truth of salvation. But until a person, and most of them out there, our teens are going into, are, that are going into college, uh, the older people, most of the people I saw doing yard work this morning were old. Most of them were older. They should know the truth by now, shouldn't they? There are people out there who have been mistaken, been misled, and are confused about the gospel truth. Not because it's been preached to them too simply, but because they have not recognized their problem. They have not recognized that they do need a savior. Not because of anything they've done, but because they've been born into sin, that the world has fallen, and that's why Jesus came. And if they live by the world's standards, they're wrong. They're just plain wrong. But we can't tell them that with words. I mean, that's abrasive, and nobody wants to get defensive, and I completely understand that. I'd be defensive too. Somebody tells me I'm wrong, the first thing I'm going to do is defend myself. And then when they show me I'm wrong, I'm like, yeah, okay, you're right. <laughs> you know, because I try to be humble, but yeah, I can be wrong. I'm not infallible, I'm a person. But it depends on what you're talking about. We're carriers. We're carriers. And he says in verse 8, And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. It's ringing out, echoing, spreading from you to people everywhere. That's what happens when people catch a passion for Jesus Christ. It spreads. It's not by anything that we do, our abilities or skills. It's because Jesus Christ is that contagious. Faith, hope, and love are that contagious. And let's look at a few verses here. When Jesus raised the little girl from the dead, Jairus' daughter in Matthew 9, it says in verse 26, news of this spread throughout all the region. When, uh, when Jesus cast out spirits, and he did that numerous times, but the one that I'm going to focus on is the, the garrison uh, Gerasene demoniac when he cast out that demon it says in verse 28 of Mark chapter 1 news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee later when the disciples perform miracles in Acts uh, Acts chapter 6 verse 7 says so the word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly what are we supposed to do what is our what is our commandment Go and make disciples of all nations. So when when the news of the when, when the word of God spread, the numbers of disciples will increase rapidly. Why did this message, news, the word of God spread? Because of their faithful work, their loving deeds, and enduring hope. Fear is contagious, but so is faith. We can be faith spreaders. 
I'm perfectly okay if somebody catches that from me. I don't want you to catch the flu, and I definitely don't want you to catch corona from me. But I'd love to give you faith. Do you hope things go back to normal? Truth about normal is, normal was comfortable. Normal, the borderline selfish. Spiritually safe. In some people's opinion, spiritually lukewarm. And that should, that should spark something from Revelation. We don't want to be like the church in Ephesus that lost its first love. I believe this should be a wake-up call for a lot of us. That the truth and hope that we celebrated last week permeates our lives and spreads. Spreads because of our faith, not because of our words. Because our hope is not in the government, although we should support our leaders. Our hope is not in a doctor, <coughs> although we definitely should pray for them and thank God for them. Our hope is not in someone spiritual, a leader, a, a, a pastor, or a, or a deacon, or a teacher. Or... Our hope is in the one who spoke the world into being. Our hope is in the all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present creator God of the universe. There's no one else like him. Our hope is in the one who heals deaf ears, opens blind eyes, and raises the dead. No man can do that. Our faith is a result of our hope because of Jesus. And who do we know that Jesus is? Out of every title that the Bible gives him, here's a few of them. He's the door in which we enter. He is the spiritual bread that strengthens our soul. He is the fountain of living water that will never run dry. He delivers the captives. He restores the broken. He strengthens the weak. He is our provider, our comforter, our source, our strength, and our redeemer. He is our rock, our sustainer, our assurance, and the firm foundation on which we are built. He is our shelter in a time of trouble. He is the light when the world is dark. He is the Prince of Peace, the Lamb of God, the Alpha and Omega, and my, in my opinion, the most important, the resurrection and the life. His goodness is indescribable. His power is incomprehensible. His grace is irresistible. At His name, darkness trembles. In His presence, demons flee. Death could not defeat Him, and the grave could not hold Him. Fear is contagious, but so is faith. Hate is contagious, but so is love. Worry is contagious, but so is hope. Let's think about our faithful work, our loving deeds, and our enduring hope. And let's spread faith, let's be contagious, and let's be encouraged that our witness is not by our own means, but by God's Holy Spirit. And He will give us the power to do what He's called us to do. I hope that what you have is worth catching. I know that it is. I know that it is if you have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. So give it to someone. Help them see it too, not just by what we say, but the way we live. And do it with a smile, like we said. Let's not be downtrodden, discouraged, and burdened. It is a burden to think about how many people are falling away from the faith. That does bother us, but it should. It should light a fire, you know? But it shouldn't burden us to the point that we have to, oh, it's on us to fix. It's not on us to fix. We're just the workers. We're just the tools by which God spreads his Holy Spirit, spreads his faith. Let's be contagious. Let's spread this good news. As the world grows darker, let our light shine brighter. As we get a song of invitation. If you have anything or anyone you'd like to pray for, the altar is open for you. And for that very reason. Yes, sir. I'd like to pray for Brother Glenn Jenkins. Brother Glenn Jenkins. Yes, okay, absolutely. Let's stand as we're saying, Faith is the victory. Hymn number 459. Let's stand as we're saying.